The year is 1942. The siege of Sevastopol has been underway for eight months. The Germans refer to the city as the most invincible fortress in the world. The siege is led by General Erich von Manstein. His tank divisions were the first to cross the Soviet border on June 22, 1941, covering 200 kilometers in five days. In less than two weeks, Manstein's forces managed to traverse half of Ukraine. He was quickly nearing Moscow, but received a new directive to head to Crimea and seize Sevastopol. The Germans were desperately trying to seize this outpost on the Black Sea. Indeed, without seizing Crimea, Germany would not have been able to initiate an assault on the Caucasus, and subsequently, the Middle East. In the winter of 1942, the elite divisions of the Wehrmacht were relocated to Sevastopol. Over a hundred thousand Soviet soldiers are defending the city's approaches from the cliffs. They received Stalin's order to defend Sevastopol at all costs. General Erich von Manstein had to penetrate the defenses and shatter the Crimean shield, but the defenders of Sevastopol fought to the death. Both the first and second Wehrmacht offensives failed. It was at this critical moment that Manstein received a message from Hitler. Meet Dora. The movement occurred only at night across Ukrainian territory. First, she arrived in Kerch, and then, under the protection of 4,000 soldiers, she was transported to Sevastopol. When Manstein first saw Dora, he shivered. And his soldiers muttered, Damn it! Some even made the sign of the cross. This creature appears to have emerged from the apocalypse. Sevastopol remained steadfast till the end. For the first time in his career, General Manstein was unable to break through enemy resistance for several months. Hitler sent his pride and joy to assist him. It was Dora. Dora was traveling on a 60-car train, and only at night. She was accompanied by 4,000 soldiers. Among the servants were teams of cooks, hairdressers, laundresses, and two chambermaids. Forty confirmed prostitutes, pure-blooded Aryans. When the German military, under the command of General Manstein, finally encountered Dora, they were taken aback. It was as tall as a three-story building and weighed one and a half thousand tons. It was the largest and most powerful cannon in the world. And her name was Dora. This supergun was manufactured under Hitler's covert directive at the German Krupp factory. It had two primary objectives. Firstly, to demolish the most robust reinforced concrete fortifications, and secondly, to intimidate the enemy's forces. Initially, our team was unaware that the Germans had brought something highly confidential. There were rumors, but no one knew anything. Only when our people discovered the remnants of a Dora shell, 815 millimeters in caliber, did they realize that the Germans had brought superweapons. But why was this dreadful weapon used only once and specifically in Sevastopol? And how could she mediate between Hitler and his best general? Erich von Manstein and Adolf Hitler. They first encountered each other in the trenches during the First World War, but they simply did not recall each other. In 1918, Manstein had already attained the rank of captain, while Hitler was merely a corporal. If we compare personal traits, then Manstein is a sociable individual, to the extent that people who served with him in Crimea recall the fun they had during the conflicts and so forth. He was a sociable person. Hitler was just the opposite, he was a fanatic. Hitler was extremely unpopular among his comrades with whom he served. In other words, he didn't drink, didn't smoke, and constantly spoke nonsense. In other words, he was somewhat of a loner. The first was a renowned skilled military officer, a descendant of an ancient lineage of illustrious German commanders. The latter was an unknown soldier who, prior to the First World War, made a living by painting postcards and resided in a shelter for the homeless, Manstein and Hitler. Then there was a chasm between them. They wouldn't meet until 20 years after World War I, but their roles would be reversed. Now the former corporal will instruct the commander on how to fight. This would irritate Manstein for the rest of his life. He wrote in his diary, 
Hitler aspired to be like Napoleon, who desired to be surrounded only by aides and executors of his will. However, the Führer lacks both the military knowledge and the military genius that Napoleon possessed. In 1936, Gero, the son of Erich Manstein, fell seriously ill. The boy was narrowly saved. He has suffered from asthma and bouts of suffocation since birth. Erich Manstein's eldest and frailest son was his favorite. Polite, calm and quiet, Gero dreamed of being like his father. To become a soldier, just like all the men in his family. Manstein attempts to dissuade him. After another severe asthma attack, the general temporarily steps away from his military career to dedicate himself to his son. While he is reading books with his son, changes are occurring in German political life. Adolf Hitler rises to power in the country and starts preparing for war. He sees himself as an ideologue, strategist and commander-in-chief. Adolf played a similar role when he was six years old, leading armies of toy soldiers. At that time, he was primarily interested in artillery. Only weaponry can determine the outcome of future major conflicts. This is what a six-year-old from Ukraine would tell his village pals. He fulfilled this dream as soon as he came to power. Under the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, Germany was prohibited from rearming itself. In 1936, Hitler secretly ordered the Krupp military manufacturing plant to develop the largest and most formidable gun in the world. Meanwhile, Manstein is with his son. The lad brilliantly excelled in the Knights Academy entrance test. In four years, he will graduate from the academy and join the infantry against his father's wishes. The war will begin in a few weeks. September 1939. Hitler delivers a speech to his soldiers in the conquered Polish city of Gdańsk. There he makes a sensational statement. Soon, Germany will employ weapons that the world has never seen before. In 1940, Germany was amassing forces for a large-scale assault on Europe. The most recent tests of the supergun are being conducted at the Krupp factory. Peter himself arrives there. He could not believe his eyes. The Führer was of average height, 5 feet 5 inches. However, standing next to this giant, he felt like a dwarf. Dora's shell was three times taller than him alone. The barrel was 30 meters long. There has never been a weapon like this in the world. How could someone conceive the idea of creating such a monster? Perhaps it was some kind of psychological necessity. In 1943, Harvard scientist Henry Murray developed a psychological profile of Hitler at the behest of the American intelligence services. He provided a detailed description of the German dictator. Hitler was a physically frail individual who suffered from neurosis and paranoia. Striving to conquer his own shortcomings, he subconsciously yearned to be the best and was attracted to all things grand. The inclination towards grandiosity and leadership has led to the development of various large-scale ideas. Some of them never happened. The world's largest stadium, an exceptional art museum in Linz, Hitler's birthplace. The broadest street, the first UFO, the first atomic bomb, and the first space rocket. However, some of the Führer's ideas were implemented. The world's first rubber doll Dora and the most powerful gun. Such an unusual gentleman set would certainly pique Dr. Sigmund Freud's interest. In 1942, General Manstein reports to Hitler, Sevastopol cannot be taken. Soviet batteries securely guarded from all directions, and the soldiers battle with remarkable fanaticism. Then Hitler decided, it's Dora's time. Top secret weapons were dispatched to Sevastopol. The dismantled weapons are loaded into 60 railway cars and shipped to Crimea. I came across a peculiar remark in Manstein's memoirs. It pertains to Dora. This is the pinnacle of technical invention, he wrote about the gun. The pinnacle, yet absolutely unfit for warfare. Why was the supergun such a disappointment to the general? 
And why didn't any Soviet historian mention the Dora near Sevastopol? Dora was secretly brought to Ukraine. It was accompanied by 4,000 soldiers, a field kitchen, and two bordellos. No Soviet general or soldier knew about it. Hundreds of thousands of Sevastopol residents also were not aware of it. The radar is being installed here, about 30 kilometers from Sevastopol. A few strikes should obliterate the city from the map. On June 5, 1942, at half past four in the morning, Manstein gave the order, prepare to fire. Two locomotives are transporting a massive weapon to a battle position. 200 soldiers are repositioning the cannon. The weapon is mounted with millimeter precision. The barrel razor lifts the barrel at an angle of 53 degrees. Manstein personally oversees all the processes. Using a special hoist, the soldiers transport two potent shells and load the cannon. It's impossible to predict where a shell will land using binoculars. The military commander orders a balloon to be lifted into the air near the cannon to adjust the aim. Weapons are ready for battle. Manstein reports this to Berlin, and Hitler authorizes the shooting to commence. Dora fires. This unique footage shows the tremendous force with which the projectile was launched. The explosion on June 5, 1942, created the world's deepest crater with a diameter of 32 meters. A supergun shell travels a distance of 25 kilometers in 44 seconds. Every shot Dora fires has such a powerful recoil that it causes a mini earthquake. The soldiers retreat several hundred meters and take cover wherever possible. Manstein then orders artillery bombardment. Each shot drove the cannon into the ground, and at the end of the day, the soldiers spent hours excavating Dora from the earth. The defenders of Sevastopol became anxious when they learned of the arrival of the super gun. She could demolish a city with a few shots. They lived each day as if it were their last, resisting all German assaults. They knew they were defenseless against the super gun. of Erich Manstein. The columns of smoke from the explosions rose up to a height of 160 meters, yet not a single hit was achieved. As I expected, the accuracy of the monstrous weapon was very low. The shell of the 30th battery weighed 470 kilograms. Dora's shell weighed 7 tons. Moscow did not believe that the Germans had brought superweapons to Sevastopol. When they saw the wreckage, they started searching, but to no avail. From the Sevastopol diary of Major General Andriy Kovtun, today, once again, a shell didn't explode. The weapon is near the battery. Daredevils ride it and even take pictures. Only when the Soviet generals saw these photographs did they realize that a classified Nazi cannon was being fired in Crimea. For some reason, the cannon doesn't hit the target. The 35th Coastal Battery of Sevastopol, this is all that's left of it. It turns out that Dora fired seven times towards the fortress. Since the siege of Sevastopol, such gaps have remained in the fortress walls. These are marks from artillery shell strikes. However, Dora's print should be 5 meters in diameter. There are no marks on the walls, which suggests that Dora never fired at the fortress. The supergun proved to be superior to its historical predecessors. The bombardment of Sevastopol lasted for a month. During this period, 66 shots were fired, all of which missed. Both the 30th and 35th batteries fired until they were out of shells. And then the defenders themselves detonated the ammunition depots within the battery. If Dora had struck this battery directly at both towers, the outcome would have been more favorable for the Germans than what we observe on these walls now. The general staff was aware of this disgraceful defeat of Dora, but they were unable to report it to the Führer. He was overly enthusiastic about his superweapon. 
Thus, to avoid disappointing Hitler, the generals of the general staff reported, Dora has destroyed the 30th battery. The cannon played a role in the siege of Sevastopol. The victory was appreciated by the military leadership and Hitler. That's why Manstein was awarded the Marshal's Baton and gained a reputation as a man for whom nothing is impossible. Indeed, Manstein seized the city at the expense of his soldiers' lives and heavy artillery fire. The very next day, Hitler promoted the general to the rank of field marshal and instituted the Crimean Shield Commemorative Award for the breakthrough at Sevastopol. But Manstein was livid. He expended too much time and effort on Hitler's whims, and it was all in vain. From this point forward, he, Field Marshal Manstein, would no longer cater to Hitler's whims, but would act as he deemed appropriate. After the capture of Sevastopol, Dora is urgently disassembled and transported to Leningrad alongside Manstein's army. Hitler wanted his supergun to replicate its success. However, Manstein, against the Führer's wishes, did not issue such an order. Dora stays in the carriages at a railway station. Manstein does not use the cannon under the excuse that its barrel is too worn out. In the trenches near Leningrad, Erich Manstein unexpectedly encounters his own son. He hadn't seen Jero in over a year. During this period, his son managed to rise to the rank of lieutenant. His father noticed the iron cross on the hero's chest. His son carried his injured comrade out of the line of fire. And then Manstein forgave his son for his decision. Jero became a good soldier, like all the men in his family. The next day, the Battle of Lake Ladoga occurred. At the headquarters, Manstein was waiting for the lieutenant, intending to give him an order. He barely understood when he was told, the lieutenant has been killed. Name, Georg Manstein. He died overnight on the front line due to an aerial bomb explosion. The field marshal buried his son on the bank of Lake Ilmen. At the funeral, the regimental chaplain said he was a regular infantry lieutenant. And then the always reserved Manstein broke down in tears. The following day, he departed from the front lines and returned home. He spends a few days with his grieving wife, who loved and cared for their firstborn deeply. Manstein returned to the front as a changed person. He issued his first ultimatum to Hitler. 1942. Intense battles for Stalingrad persist. Manstein arrives at Hitler's headquarters. Instead of deciding to retreat and thereby save the soldiers, the Führer proposes to employ the Dora cannon once more in battle. And then the field marshal didn't hold back. For the first time, he told Hitler the true value of his colossal cannon. This enormous cannon never hit its target, proving to be utterly ineffective, much like its creator, the Führer. For the first time, Hitler was at a loss for words. Only then did Manstein express to Hitler the cherished dream of all German generals from the general staff. He, Hitler, must step down, cease meddling in military affairs, and allow the professionals, whose orders are always executed, to wage war. They were simply individuals with diverse backgrounds. The professional continued to perform his duties, serving the newly established Germany. The fanatic Hitler sought to reshape Germany, which he found dissatisfactory, and ultimately to disrupt the global order, which he also disapproved of. Witnesses to this argument remember that Hitler got extremely angry. He yelled, ripped up papers, and then threw himself on the carpet, biting into it. For some reason, however, the Führer did not dismiss Manstein afterward. During the three years of the war, Erich Manstein emerged as Germany's favored military leader, admired and appreciated by his soldiers. The field marshal defies Hitler's order prohibiting the execution of captured Russian commissars, and after the Battle of Stalingrad, he rescues 30,000 German officers who were commanded by the Führer to perish in the siege. In 1943, a plot was hatched among the generals in Hitler's inner circle. The military recognizes that Germany has already lost this war. Hitler needs to be overthrown, and a military coup needs to be executed to safeguard Germany and restore peace in the country. 
Manstein was approached with a proposal to lead this coup, but the field marshal declined, explaining that his role was solely to fight. He is not a politician, but a military man. However, he would support the new military regime after Hitler's assassination. In January 1944, Adolf Hitler called the generals for an urgent meeting. He no longer conceals the fact that Germany is losing the war. Hitler begins to openly ridicule his generals. He questions them if they are prepared to stand by his side until the final moment, with their daggers drawn. Then Manstein suddenly stood up. He exclaims, that is exactly what will happen, my leader. Hitler never forgave his top strategist for this act. A few months later, he dismissed Manstein from his post. In this instance, Hitler, as it were, removed a military leader from the German army who was deemed too aggressive, too rebellious. Manstein was dismissed rather gently, so to speak, with the concurrent bestowal of swords or diamonds to the Knight's Cross. He was honored and supposedly sent into a dignified retirement. Six months after this incident, the general's plot to assassinate the Führer was abruptly foiled, and all the skilled generals were executed. Adolf Hitler kept a framed photo of the executed conspirators on his desk until his final days, as Soviet bombs were already falling on Berlin. Erich Manstein unveiled his secrets towards the end of his life in two volumes of his memoirs. After the Nuremberg trials, the renowned field marshal served only three years in prison. He was released from prison due to health reasons. However, Manstein lived a long life and passed away in 1973. At the time, he was 86 years old. His memoirs were immediately prohibited in the Soviet Union. In them, he unveiled the secret behind the failure of the Dora gun. Manstein knew that massive weapons never fire accurately. He did not hold high expectations for this colossal weapon. Unlike Hitler, who placed more faith in technology than in people, the field marshal esteemed his soldiers above everything else. This is what led him to victories. Along with Erich Manstein's memoirs, the Soviet Union prohibited any mention of Hitler's final project, the enormous Dora cannon. According to the official account from Soviet historians, there was no Dora in Sevastopol whatsoever. However, people learned about the world's largest cannon from the Soviet film, The Skywalker. The humorous love story of pilots during the war incorporated a parody of General Manstein and his superweapon, which was purported to obliterate the entire Soviet Union with a single shot. In the movie, this cannon was bombarded with comedic ease by Soviet planes. But what became of the actual Dora? Today, there are no remnants of Sevastopol's bombardment by the super cannon left in the city, only a small German model. This is what the largest and most powerful cannon in the world looked like. Today, this is the only model of Dora. 65 years ago, this weapon could have altered history. If Dora had hit her target, this museum, as well as the entire city, might not have existed. In 1943, German soldiers inscribed on the walls of the 30th Battery, which had fallen in the Battle of Sevastopol, declaring it to be the strongest fortress in the world. The world's largest cannon was discovered in Bavaria by American troops in 1945. All parts of the supergun were destroyed, except for the massive 30-meter barrel. Practical Americans used this metal to manufacture new tanks. Such a massive cannon never aided Adolf Hitler in conquering the entire world, and his final creation remains in history as a symbol of shattered illusions and grand defeat.